So thank you everybody for joining the nanomedicine um, uh, series, the uh, nano seminar uh, series, either in uh, person or on Zoom. Hope you can all hear us uh, from uh, Zoom. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have with us a liposome expert today, Professor Yvonne Perry. Uh, before though the keynote uh, lecture, uh, we're happy to wel welcome um, a research fellow visitor uh, in nanomedicine lab, and he's coming from Melbourne, uh, David, uh, to talk to us about the Andipec production as a response of uh, COVID uh, vaccines. Please write your questions in chat and we will address those uh, at the end of this uh, first uh, talk. David? So yeah, thanks Marina for the introduction. So today my talk is about our recent uh, clinical study on anti-PAC antibody boost in human by SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines. So, um, oops, yep. So I think um, most people in the audience probably already got three or four dose of mRNA vaccines. So mRNA lipinama particle vaccine is really successful. It's revolutionized the prevention of the COVID-19 and it's gonna be increasing um, um, uh, use in uh, future um, prevention of disease or in cancers. So what is lipid nanoparticle? If you look at closely, there's four types of lipids. There's ionizable lipid, which used to, um, to form complex with mRNA. There's a um, cholesterol and hyperlipid to form the structure of lipid nanoparticle. And there's a pack lipid. It's mainly on the surface to maintain the colloidal stability of the nanoparticles. So, um, so, so here is the uh, chromium image of lipid nanoparticles. You can see their um, solid structure of the lipids. So what is the PAG lipids? What is the PAG? So PAG is acetine, polyethylene glucose. It's a FDA approved polymer. Uh, it mainly used to maintain the colloidal stability of nanoparticles. Um, so uh, study using um, a lot of nanomedicine particles using it for uh, maintain to reduce non-specific protein absorption or cell association uh, to extend in level circulation time. Um, but there are also concern about the PAG. So right before the fire distribution of Pfizer in the US, there's already a science article uh, I mentioned about the concern about why the PAG in the particles in the lipid nanoparticle will cause any allergies. And also um, in the literature, in the scientific literature, also people ask where is the data about, uh, for example, here in this paper, uh, no data is available on why the vaccine induced antibody against PAG. And if 3.4% of population in the world generate anti-PAG antibody response, this may be a game changer for pag related therapies. And of course, uh, um, it's, uh, right, uh, it's important to determine this as soon as possible. Um, and how this may affect other pegylated therapies in patients. Another uh, study also published in 2022 saying uh, no data on uh, what happens after vaccination in humans. So right before the uh, vaccine is distributed in, uh, in Australia, so we start our, our uh, study design. So uh, we have this research question for us is after SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine, whether the anti pack antibody will be induced or boost in the human blood. If there's a human anti pack antibody boost, whether this has an impact to vaccine immunogenicity and reactogenicity. And if there's a boost, whether this will impact the future response to other pack containing therapies. So with those research questions, we, we frame our uh, study plan as uh, we uh, recruit the human subjects for the clinical study. We recruit first uh, co uh, uh, the uh, cohort of uh, Pfizer vaccine, 55 subjects uh, getting two doses of Pfizer vaccine on 25 days in between. And we also recruit a second cohort is uh, uh, 20 subjects receiving two doses of Moderna vaccine on 28 days in between. And we also have an unvaccinated control cohort is 55 subjects without any vaccination. Um, they, this include 40 uh, uh, infected um, patients who was infected by COVID but recovered and 15 uh, is healthy subjects. So we first assess uh, anti pack antibody levels in, uh, uh, in humans. So that's before vaccination or after. So I put this here. Hopefully this 
um, before vaccination or after second dose of vaccination. So this is the uh, result from Pfizer. Um, um, so you can see the antibody and body levels. This is um, same donor um, um, monitor. You can see they are slightly increased for some of donors, but for the Moderna donors, you can see most of patients has a uh, like more than ten time uh, for the change after vaccination, uh, um, and for the control uh, and for the control and vaccine control, we monitor the level of anti pack antibodies over six months period. So some of them slightly decrease, but most of them remain stable. Um, for the anti pack IgM, is similar uh, with anti pack IgG. Uh, Pfizer slightly increased. Moderna significantly increased, more than tenfold the change for most of subjects. And the unvaccinated control is not much changing uh, over six months period. So we summarize this, uh, look at the whole, the mean for the change of the whole population, you can see uh, this three cohort, unvaccinated control cohort is not much changing, but Moderna um, is giving you highest boost of anti-pack IgG and IgM. Um, so overall the mean for the change of Moderna for anti pack IgG is 13 for the change. Anti pack IgM is 68 for the change, but the Pfizer is about one to two for the change. For unvaccinated control, is slightly decreasing about 0 0.92 or 0 0.98, so not much changing. Um, so we also assess the antibody specificity to the uh, COVID 19, uh, to the lipid component of vaccines. So here we using ELISA, we assess, we found for all these 18 human plasma donors, for those anti pack antibody response to the pike, they also respond to the pike lipids. So this is a, a pike lipid in the Pfizer. This is a pike DMG pike lipid in the Moderna. Um, but for anti pack antibody, they didn't respond to any of the ionizable lipids or hyper lipids or, um, in those uh, samples. This was further confirmed using monoclonal anti pack antibodies. Again, this shows a, a dose dependent response to PAC or PAC lipid, no response to ionizable lipid or hyper lipids. So, why Moderna has higher response than Pfizer? We don't know. But from the uh, dose, uh, you can see the Moderna have three times dose, higher dose than the Pfizer. And if we calculate the PAC lipid in the Pfizer and the Moderna, is about uh, 2.5 times difference. So it could be because of the dose difference making they have different response, but this need for the studies. So uh, then we also study how is anti pack antibody gonna respond to the vaccine immunogenicity. So we have access to the PC3 lab and we using the uh, live cell to assess the SARS-CoV-2 specific neutralizing antibody response. And we study how anti pack antibody is correlated to this response we found there's no correlation between anti pack antibody to the uh, neutralization antibody, which tell us those anti pack antibody do, do not interfere with vaccine immunogenicity. So that's a good thing. And then we also assess the rectal genicity. So rectal genicity is advanced events self reported by the subjects, uh, for example, local pain or uh, swelling, that's called local rectal genicity. Or if you have fatigue, fever, that's we uh, included uh, into the systematic rectal genicity. So based on this uh, low, uh, uh, self report, uh, report uh, we have this rectal genesis score, and then we assess how anti pack antibody correlated to the rectal genesity. So to our uh, quite surprising to us, we found um, uh, um, anti pack antibody, both anti pack IgG and anti pack IgM, the change of anti pack IgG IgM correlated to the systematic rectal genesity, but not correlated to the local rectal genesity. But this also makes sense because anti pack antibody is mainly in the blood. So that could be the reason of why they have an, these correlations. Um, uh, and finally, we also assess how anti pack antibody is going to affect the impact of future pack related nanomedicine. So we designed this assays uh, using human blood. So we have um, pack related nanoparticle as a pack related uh, as pack particle medicine. And then we incubate um, plasma uh, 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 collected from donor before vaccine or after two doses of vaccine, and then incubated back into the blood cells, wash blood, and to assess the particle immune cell association using flow cytometry. So the antibody uh, cocktail labeled the cells is different fluorescence, and particle also has their own fluorescence. Therefore, we can determine particle cell associations. Um, so uh, from those results, you can see the um, 
uh, pre-existing anti-pack antibodies have a strong correlation with particle immune cell association with granular site and monocyte in the human blood. Um, this is also uh, true for the anti-pack IgM. Um, even more is when we have the anti-pack antibody boost after vaccine, the cell association, uh, the nanomedicine association with granular site was significantly boosted. And the increase of cell association is strongly correlated with increase of anti-pack antibodies in the blood. Um, so this is uh, also in correlated with anti-pack anti uh, IgM and IgG. So in conclusion, we found anti-pack antibody was boosted by the COVID-19 vaccines, um, most, uh, mostly booked by the um, Moderna, but less extent by the Pfizer. And anti-pack antibody uh, pre-vaccination didn't negatively impact the uh, immunogenicity, but they do correlate with higher systematic reactogenicity. But of course, larger study need to confirm their causal relationship. And a risk of antibody antibody can associate with higher um, packed nanomedicine to blood immune cell association. So this means um, potentially if you have higher level antibody antibody, uh, if future you need a medicine for cancer, they may cause they have lower uh, pharmacokinetics. Um, but we don't know this. This is still need to be studied. So right before, right after our study published, there are a few other studies published on similar uh, anti-pack monitor anti-pack antibody uh, after vaccines. So this is a study from US, um, and this is another study from Hungary. This is another study from Italy, and this is a recent study studied subjects from Israel. So they all reached the same conclusion: is anti-pack antibody were boosted by the vaccine. So what is next? So next is uh, we don't know still uh, we don't know is what is the mechanism of causing anti pack antibody uh, vaccines in the blood uh, in, in the uh, so this is a mechanism study is really important to, for us to understanding and more important is what is the clinical impact of this whether this will cause uh, accelerate a clearance of pack medicine or whether this cause a uh, changed uh, vaccine immunogenicity and regulogenicity this need further studies um, on this. So finally, um, um, sorry, I would like to acknowledge my mentors and also collaborators um, in these projects. And also um, I would like to uh, thank Costa and Marlena for hosting me in this uh, wonderful group and all the group members for helping me to settle down in this group. Thank you. Hello, yeah. Uh, so any questions in the room for David before we, yeah. Hi David, and thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my first question is, when did you measure uh, the antibodies after vaccination? How much time? One day, one week, two weeks? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, with, um so we measure them at different time point. For the time point I show is two time two weeks after boost, but we do have data to show the timeline as well. For example, this one is um, pre-vaccine three weeks after uh, first dose, one month after first dose, or three months after dose. This is for the Pfizer though, and also three weeks, one month. One. So we show a uh, different time point, but mainly it's about two weeks after boost. So is there any difference in this? If you measure between one week and two weeks, is there a difference in the values in the production of antibodies? So um so after after so we found after first dose, the anti-pack antibody was not significant increase, but after second dose, after a week, then they they strongly showing it. And actually, my last question is: did you do any correlation between the age of the participants and the production of the antibodies? The age. Yes, because I, I think you have a range between 25 and... Oh, you mean the age? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did that. So we um, so in this study, we show the anti-pack antibody, pre-existing anti-pack antibody was uh, negatively correlated with the age, both for the IgG and IgM. Um, also, they are uh, negatively... Uh, also, we found the uh, sex is... Um, sorry, uh, sex is affecting, so female is more... Uh, have higher level of anti-pack antibodies than male. So the pre-existing anti-pack antibody is uh, sex and age dependent, but the boost is not sex or age dependent. They all have similar level of um, boost after vaccine. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
Any other questions? Hi, David. So your this boost dose was three weeks after the first dose, which was what was kind of recommended, right? But uh, in some countries, so the UK, they actually delayed the second dose of the vaccine for 12 weeks after the first dose. Yeah. So is there any data on, you know, what the effect of the time between the first and second dose? And then I guess also considering these boosters now that people are having every year, what, how that affects um, yeah. anti antibody so production? I think in general, it's like if you have a longer time, it will be better for a higher dose. So, so the boost level will be higher. But in our study, we all are getting, we studied the fourth round of Pfizer and Moderna. So they all have about three weeks in between. But I guess if you have longer time and the immune genesity should be higher. But at least this is uh, happened to the observed in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, specific antibodies. But no study on PAG antibody yet. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, I have two questions. One has to do with the Moderna versus Pfizer. Yep. Because you're showing dramatic difference. Yes. Do we know the molecular culprit behind this difference? What is this difference due to? Um, so um, the PAG is all the um, the PAG lipid is, was slightly different, but PAG is uh, two thousand kilo Dalton. So PAG molecular weight is same and PAG structure is same. It's just the lipid is slightly different, but dose also different. Um, um, so um, the, the, the amount is, um, uh, and the pack DP is about, I mean, the Moderna is two times, 2.5 times higher than. So is there some opinion formulating now that there's a, the, the higher response that you're seeing due to the fact that the dose is different? So because we suspect seen... maybe dose play a role, mm -hmm. but it could be also other um, roles in, for example, lipid formulation or maybe ionizable lipid. Maybe uh, make also making them different because elders of people can cause them have immunogenicity. So um so they may uh, interfere with each other. So has any study um, tried to do the same dose between the two? Yeah, yeah. So and trying it, to to uh, harmonize at least at this parameter. Yeah. And see if you have differences. Yeah. So that would be interesting study if we can do. Yeah. Okay. And my last question has to do with this in your initial paper you cited, there was this 3.4% responded, uh, or people that reacted, more or less, is that is the percentage that I recall? Uh, yeah, so that one is a review paper. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just saying like about, like at that time, it's about 3.4% of people yeah. getting Pfizer vaccine. Right. So they will suspect if those people like a whole population getting Correct. vaccine. So do we have any whole population data? Now that there's many more studies coming along yep. to indicate what type of respond responses we are um, looking at in you know in the wider population. So now it's like I I, I show in the last slides like there's a world population from Europe, from US, from Israel. They all showing anti pack antibody boost. But um, um, so, and you have global population uh, showing in the um, I think uh, website on uh, World Health Organization. So is there like a global per percentage that's coming coming along? Yeah, I think billions of people getting vaccines, uh, mRNA vaccines already. But not not we don't know how much percentage of people getting boost yet. We don't know. And do we know how many what percentage of the people that are vaccinated getting re react to the um? The peg. peg, yeah, this we don't know yet. We, mm -hmm. we, we, we because it's all the local study, and we found different local study show slightly different results. Right. So yeah. So there's no homogeneity in the. No, no. no Thank you. Okay, I think it's time to move on to the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much, David. So a few words uh, about Yvonne. Um. So as I mentioned, it's a great pleasure to have a liposome expert with us. So Yvonne is a professor in drug delivery at the University of uh, Strathclyde in Scotland. And she gained a PhD at the University uh, College of London, where she actually investigated uh, liposomes and DNA vaccines. She then moved to a, a startup company, a drug delivery company, uh, for two years before she established her own uh, research group at Aston University. She was appointed professor in drug delivery in 2007 
And in 2016, uh, she moved to the University of uh, Strathclyde. Her research focuses on the basically development of drug delivery systems and vaccines, and she is internationally uh, recognized for her contributions uh, in liposome uh, drug delivery uh, systems. Uh, she has been awarded a number of fellowships and awards, including uh, the most recent uh, Royal uh, Pharmaceutical Society Harrison uh, Memorial uh, Medal. So Yvonne, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks for the kind introduction, the opportunity to speak today and also to follow up David. So that was a great introduction, really interesting talk. So that really sets the scene for me. So thanks for that. I got lots of notes, so that's great. So yeah, I'm going to follow up more focusing on manufacturing considerations using microfluidic systems. because We work a lot on that and it really comes from my journey of working in a, a, an SME where we were at, trying to develop a liposomal delivery system for a, a DNA vaccines and many times we were asked how do you scale this up can you manufacture and we didn't have the answer at that time and obviously that was some time ago but that's what got me actually thinking about yeah we really need that translation off the bench and into the clinic and that kind of underpinned a lot of the work we've been doing particularly at Strathclyde. Right, so. <laughs> so microfluidics I'm sure many of you are familiar with it but the general principle is if we're making liposomes or LMPs we dissolve our lipids in solvent it has to be a water miscible solvent and we have our drug in the aqueous buffer if it's water soluble you can put it in the ethanol phase we basically nano precipitate them under controlled systems and out comes our nanoparticles whatever we want we can also do this with polymers as well so it's basically just you are a nano precipitating due to that change in polarity. And that's used actually in the production of the vaccines that we are familiar with too. And one of the things that you'll see, particularly when we work with liposomes, is the effect of that reduction in ethanol concentration. If you do it very quickly, the lipids don't have much time to form a raft, so they form small vesicles. But if you can slow that change in polarity down with that ethanol concentration, you can form larger vesicles. So we have an element of control with liposomes in terms of particle size, less so with the LMP structures because there is a complexing involved in that, but that gives us some process control under it. So we wanted to look at this in more detail and make sure we understand the properties of that. So in terms of mixers we can use in microfluidics, there's many different options. And for those that work with the TNI technology, the, the staggered herringbone is what most of us would have used with the nano assembler. If you're mo moving over to the Ignite or those platforms, it's this toroidal mixer. But also you can have a basic T mixer, which I believe is used in Pfizer formulation, though they may have scaled up, and then you've got hydrodynamic flow. So all of these are variations on a theme, but they all work by the same way. You're mixing two, your alcohol and your water, you cause nano precipitation and out come your particles, be that polymers, liposomes, LMPs. And the key parameters in manufacture is how quickly we run this, how quickly we mix that ratio. So those are the two kind of key things in terms of process parameters that we can control. So the other technology we are beginning to look at, because all those cartridges are moving to single use, and the advantage of single use is when you go into a clean room, the validation process is very good. You can work with it. The downside of that is during the pandemic, I'm sure many of you experienced it, the supply chain pretty much fell apart. You couldn't even get the pet tips. So access to consumables then becomes a risk for your production if you can't access those cartridges in this case. So we are also looking at this microphore technology, which basically has two streams. So it's a tube with an insert and you basically flow through your ethanol, it comes through, mixes with aqueous phase, and again, you get that nano precipitation. So we are looking at this technology now. Most of the data today I'm presenting is based on PNI technology, but there is very many options out there. And it is that trade-off between the single use, which is cheap and easy to get into your GNP facility, but you need to get the cartridges versus the reusable. Like this is stainless steel. 
that you've got a day's validation cleaning between preps. So those are the balances we have. So as I say, we tend to be using the nano precipitate PNI technology at the moment, and within Strathclyde, we have the suite of them from the very small microliter through to GMP production, and we, ha we can GMP produce using this technology in our GMP facilities. And we have the full suite from characterization through to the in vivo analysis. And we use this technology to make liposomes, LMPs, solid lipid nanoparticles, the polymers, and we have also made nano emulsions. Those are the hardest because they do tend to gunk up your cartridge, I would say. So those ones that are challenges the most. In terms of ease, the LMPs are definitely the easiest to make. So I would say that's your kind of scale. So we saw that earlier, but just to clarify, because sometimes people debate this, it's, it's a hot debate because it will come into IP, uh, intellectual property, but it's kind of terminology. A liposome has an aqueous core with a bilayer. Your LMPs has condensed around an electrostatic, so they have a more electron dense core. But ultimately, they're all made of lipids and they're all nanoparticle sizes. So the debate can rage as much as people want, and it'll be for the lawyers to determine what the difference is. But you can see here's some a couple of cryos we did. It's cryo TEM. Here's your liposome with the aqueous core. Here's our LMP zoomed in a bit more, but you can see it's more an electron dense core. We don't have that aqueous core inside it so notably. So that's the morphology difference. But I'll talk about both of those in terms of manufacturing. So this is our manufacturing platform, microfluidics for manufacture. You do have to remember get rid of that alcohol. Tragic for us, Scott, to say get rid of alcohol. You should never do it, but you know we have to do it. We do then monitor, and then obviously we sterilize. And with these, because they are for injection, you're generally looking at end sterilization in that process. And again, as I say, for production, we're based on microfluidics. So with the process, as I said, the key things most people are interested in, in terms of scale up, is how quickly you can run the system. But what we can control in terms of process is how we mix those two ratios. And then we've got the considerations of our material attributes, our lipid concentrations. We are uh, limited that, buffer has an impact. As I say, these are our uh, process parameters and the obvious critical uh, quality attributes. And this would go in, if you're going to a regulator, your module three package, they always want to know particle size, PDI, base potential, yield, loading, release, and efficacy. So those would always go into any submission going in for regulatory approval. So if we look first at production. So in terms of process parameters, as I've said, key things we've thought about is choice of solvent. Ethanol is your go-to for many of us, but even in production, ethanol is your go-to, but there are other options that are class three solvents that we can use. The other thing is the choice of buffer. So you would think, why is that a big deal? But if you look, it can have an impact both on our liposome formulations and if you followed the journey of the Moderna and va uh, Pfizer vaccines, Moderna started with Tris buffer and then went to Tris sucrose. Tris is quite an unusual choice for a vaccine, you would have thought. Pfizer started in PBS, but then switched to Tris. So th there's interest in, if you track through those products, how they've changed over time. So those are the two attributes we tend to look at. So if we look at choice of solvent first. So with microfluidics, and that was one of my biggest mistakes when I first bought the kit, we'd always use chloroform and never really thought anything about it, but you do need a water miscible solvent. So you're really limited to basically anything that has water solubility. So your methanol, your ethanol, IPA is another one. And then you've got to make sure it doesn't dissolve your cartridge in microfluidics. So acetonitrile is another one you can get away with, but you have to uh, consider how the cartridge will handle that. So really, we stick with those three, methanol, ethanol, and IPA. And we've nicely heard already about composition of LMPs. But one consideration is your max solubility. So it's roughly about 70 mg per mil if you're making a, lipos a liposome or an LMP formulation. That's the maximum concentration you can start at. And remember, we're doing a mixing, so you're going to have to dilute. So that is a consideration in your manufacturing process. But what we did look at, and this is with, firstly, I'll talk about LMPs. We looked at methanol, ethanol, and IPA. And we don't see any significant difference. You might think, oh, there's a trend there. It's when we do the stats, there's no notable difference in size. Our PDI is nice and low, so size is the bars. 
dots are PDI, and that goes throughout. So size is looking the same, PDI is small. Zeta potential is round about neutral, as we would hope for a LMP. And then in terms of loading, this is mRNA loading. Again, your orange bar is how much is loaded. Our white dots here are mass balance or yield or recovery, whatever you want to do. Basically, what we get in, what do we get out? And you can see it's high. So choice of solvent with the LMP formulations. And this is a copy of the Pfizer product. You see no impact with choice of solvent. So but ethanol is your go-to. But if you then move to liposomes, you see quite a different story. So here's cryo-EM. Here's a one's made with methanol, one's made with ethanol, and one's made with IPA, all at the same scale bar. So very obvious visually, the IPA ones are much bigger in a couple, eh, sometimes two bilayers. And that particle size is retained over time. So the methanol and ethanol ones are roughly the same. They stay around about 50 to 60 nanometers over seven days. So it's not a quick thing and they change. IPA, 90, and they stay there. So if you do want to manipulate your particle size with the liposomes, then you have that opportunity just by switching out solvents. In terms of loading, though, interestingly, this is protein we've loaded. The IPA, although they're bigger, tended to reduce loading of protein. It was bovine serum albumin we used here, so standard protein. But in terms of release, once we uh, averaged out, so they all started with the same concentration, the release profiles are the same. So the bilayer has the same properties, but how much you can get in, interestingly, the bigger ones load less, but it might be due to this double bilayer we're seeing. So choice of solvent is important and as a characteristic. It doesn't affect all your particles that you might be looking at, but definitely it's something you should look at. But your go-to is always ethanol in terms of regulatory process and ability to scale up. But the other thing is, if you mix your alcohols, you can actually fine tune that size. So methanol and ethanol, they were roughly the same. If you mix them, you didn't see a notable difference. So here, this is our size and this is our PDI. And remember, you always want your PDI below about 0.2 is kind of the cutoff. You might get away with 0.25 in some submissions, but 0.2 is where you, you're kind of benchmark. So methanol, ethanol, not much difference. If you start doping in your IPA, which was forcing up the particle size, you can really blend that particle size for liposomes from a small size up to a big size. So we can fine tune that particle size when mixing our lipids without upsetting our heterogeneity. And again, you can do that with, sorry, IPA and ethanol. So IPA and methanol or ethanol, you've got that size control just by varying that change in polarity in the mixing process. Now, interestingly, when we look at the cationic formulations, so this is a fusogenic uh, liposome that's mainly used for delivery of DNA. DOP DOTAP, it's been around for many years. Peter Felger uh, developed it. You can buy it off the shelf. But you, again, you see that control of size, but what you see the IPA pushes up the size. But if you start to then mess about with formulations that look more like LMPs and put in the peg that we were nicely hearing about, it gets rid of that change. So even at the manufacturing stage, never mind the biological stage, the presence of PEG is affecting the manufacturing process. So it's interesting to see that all through from manufacture through to biological input, as we've just heard from David, PEG is having an impact. And at the amount of PEG we put in has this impact. So this is back at the DSPC lysosomes. So with ethanol, less impacted by PEG, but definitely IPA, your PEG content pushes down your particle size. So again, it's that combination of formulation, manufacturing techniques are all impacting on particle size. And particle size, as we all know, with nanoparticles is one of the, the most important things. It's a measure of the quality of your product, but also can affect by distribution and efficacy. So that's all about the alcohol. Let's move on to this, the other option. So remember, you get your alcohol with your lipids, and then you've got your buffer where your drug might be in, or your mRNA if you're putting mRNA in. So this is mRNA. So in the manufacture, the RNA is actually in a citrate buffer, uh, normally 50 millimolar, but we try 10 and 100. There's some variation in size, but generally it's there's no obvious trend, which we were a bit disappointed about, and it certainly doesn't 
impact on loading or return of your product out of production. So generally people use the 50 nanometers. Uh, I don't know if we can claim that that gives the smallest size. I think here we, we see some variation and it's something that needs to be looked at. But most people are using 50. But then if we look at the liposomes, it's very different. So here are what we've been making. So we had a lipid mix with the aqueous phase being crisp buffer. We can make small uh, cationic liposomes and they stay quite happily and that's the black line there. If we switch out to a very high concentration crisp buffer, so we basically make it high, we can actually produce much higher LM, uh, liposomes here. So they're 500 nanometers in size and it's nothing to do with removal of the buffer. Once we take out buffer exchange and take it back to normal crisp, so it could be injected into mice and we did do this, they keep that size. And really to be able to produce a 500 nanometer liposome using microfluidics before had never been achievable before for us. Normally they were very heterogeneous and ugly products, but they are quite monodispersed, but a much larger size. So again, we've got ability to just to switch out materials and get that different size. But it doesn't happen with all of the lipid formulations. So with Dota, definitely as we push up the Tris buffer concentration, we increase size. And you can see it is mono, mainly mono dispersed. P PDI stays below 0.2. With a different cationic lipid, diolio ammonium bromide, that's quite an immunogenic lipid that we tend to use in subunit vaccines, even more sensitive to presence of TRIS. And, but again, you can see here, it's mono dispersed, below 0.2. Whereas DSPC cholesterol doesn't care, can handle any TRIS concentration. So diastereophosphatidylcholine cholesterol is the backbone for most of the liposome products that have been approved. And as I say, in terms of dispersity, it's not that we're getting ugly aggregates. They are nice mono dispersed, the PDI is staying nice and low. So basically from this, again, we've found another lever that we can pull to change these particle sizes. So we've looked at the mixing. Let's see about how the ratio affects. So we're now back to the manufacturer so you can change this control. So this is a one-to-one, 50% -one, ethanol, 50% water, or aqueous buffer. Then we've got two aqueous to one alcohol, three aqueous to one. So again, the yellow is the size, the dot is the PDI. So one-to-one, -one, we get very ugly particles. They are very heterogeneous and they do precipitate out. Two to one and three to one are looking good, very similar in size. Again, loading is rubbish. These are LMPs if we're at the one-to-one. -one. And again, I think it's just because we have just a heterogeneous mess in the ethanols here. So what's the leverage? Can we actually tweak this particle size more? Well, yes. So we actually can use integers. So this is one-to-one, 1 1.2 1. to one. So the, the mask gets a bit funky, but you get there 1.3, but you can see our yellow is our size. We can pull down our size, get that PDI down and give us more size control. So one, one way to look at it is, yes, we can control the particle size. The other way to look at it is if you're going regulatory submission, this is the boundaries within which I can work before I start to mess up my particle size. So there's two ways to look at it. And if you zoom in more, these are the formulations in terms of if what we are currently looking at in terms of in vivo studies, but I, they've just gone into the animal, so I don't have it. They do load well, as I can see here. So again, yellow bars, how much mRNA we've got in black dots are recovery. Why do I focus on that? The mRNA is super expensive, so you need to get it back out of your machine. And then zeta potential is just one of those markers. Again, they should be around about neutral, but it's interesting how much more variable the larger ones in terms of size are. Again, I think it's just, you get quite a heterogeneous mix, so your zeta potential goes a bit more varied. So those are all parameters and levers we can control to change size. But what about speed? Everybody just wants product ramped up, ramped up, ramped up as fast as you can. So you want to be able to produce in the lab at small scale, nice and cheap, with, but then not having to do an engineering batch and a manufacturing batch down in your GMP. You want to be able to take your process, what you do in the lab, straight onto GMP because it's very expensive doing these runs. So. This last one, we ran at 10 and 20 mils per minute, and that's as fast as we can go in the lab. So you're like, oh, 20 mils a minute. It's quite exciting in the lab. It's pointless at GMP. That's like going to take you days and days and days. But we know our lab scale doesn't affect 
when we ramp up the speed. But really, 20 mils per minute is pointless. As I say, 60 mils is preclinical. So we have the blaze that we do preclinical studies on, but our GMP system runs at 200 mils per minute. So that's where you want to be. And even that, you know, is not the fastest machine in the world. And I think, you know, generally, if you were doing, well, when they were manufacturing the pandemic, I'm pretty sure they scaled out and parallel run them. So can we go from what we were doing in the lab to GMP? So in this, basically there was a switch in the microfluidic mixer between the machines, but again, size is green, white dots are PDI. And what I'm showing you here is what we did in the bench, we took to the GMP facility, we ran the same process, but a much faster speed, and we got the same particle size and PDI, and we got the same loading. So that reassures us whatever we are doing in the lab, we can walk down into our GMP and map to it with the same manufacturing process. So everything we can do in the lab is translatable. And that was just basically addressing that fundamental question that I always faced when I was in industry. How are you going to scale this up? Well, now we can answer it. We can easily scale up. That's all about the microfluidic manufacturing. And I, I would say even when I started with microfluidics, I was very naive about the removal of the solvent. I thought it'd be straightforward. And I would say TFF, tangential flow filtration, is a very slow, slow and frustrating step. So you can manufacture it 200 mils per minute. But I think our TFF is running about 40 max. So that's quite a slow process. And remember, if you run at that three to one ratio I was talking about, which gave us a nice size, You've got 25% ethanol you need to get out. So you can either dilute and then concentrate, and that's commonly what we do with the liposomes. Uh, and, or we can, uh, sorry, we wash and then do that, or you can dilute and concentrate. Option is some people think that the presence of ethanol might be destabilizing your particles. So you dilute it out straight away and then concentrate back to the concentration you want. But other people say you can just wash out the ethanol. We've tried both and we see no difference, but obviously we're not holding these formulations for like 24 hours with ethanol. So those are the two things, but it's something to think about with microfluidics, making sure you get that ethanol back out. So let's think about choice of payload. So this is more focused on our LMPs now. So what we tend to look at is there's a range of nucleic acids we've been looking at. So poly A is not of biological relevance, but it's a very cheap surrogate for those wanting to work in the mRNA field. So we tend to work with poly A, it's very small, but then we've got a range of mRNAs we've used. So the clean cap technology is uh, what's used in the vaccines. And then we had a range of different self-amplifying RNAs, which we got from PNI. The difference is the mRNA is slightly smaller in size. So mRNA, it goes in, one mRNA produces one antigen plus ours, whereas the self-amplifying RNA can do replicates within the cell and then so you can basically dose down. And that was the premise of Robin Shattuck, the Imperial vaccine. You remember if you were following the news at the time, so Imperial were developing their vaccine. They got very good data, but it was a first run at a clinical trial and uh, obviously, Pfizer had a lot more experience and more data by the time that came through. But the self-amplifying RNA will bring us an ability to dose reduce, which will bring down cost and hopefully widen global access. So there's a lot to be said for pursuing that. But the key thing is you, they start to get bigger and bigger when you go self-amplifying. So point of this graph, what I'm trying to show you is with these LMPs, it really doesn't matter your nucleic acid size. They always, eh, they always produce LMPs of the same size. They always have near neutral and they always load. So it is a platform technology. The FDA are not accepting it as a platform technology yet, but they are getting there in terms of this is just a building block. We can wrap it around any mRNA and we get the same product. So that's where we want to push to, but at the moment it's not recognized as platform technology. But what you have to think about is the new bivalents, they came on board and they are a mixture of two different RNAs, remember? So we've got the, the original, which was the original spike. Uh, and then you have, so you either split so the Moderna instead of having 100 of the original, they've got 50 of the original and various variations of different uh, Omicron versions. The Pfizer, as we heard, is a lower dose at 30, but again, it's now 
15 of the original and 15 micrograms of various uh, Omicron variants. The B, I think we're on the BA5 now, but I can't actually remember myself. So you can see how they've done that. They've just, uh, they're saying it's a platform and you can switch in and out your mRNA. So we wanted to look at how easily we could switch out in and out mRNA versus self amplifying RNA. And here we're looking at particle size. Really the take home message is we can load any of these and we get good particles below 100 nanometers. They're always near neutral and they always give us decent loading. And these all encode for different proteins in that respect. So again, we can wrap them up in different LMPs and it's not a problem for us. But in terms of how does that efficacy work out if we compare mRNA versus self-amplifying RNA? So what we did was we took mRNA including luciferase, which is a protein that basically luminesces in vivo. So we can measure that. Uh, and we took it again with a self-amplifying RNA, obviously a five times lower dose because it's more potent. And we took it in two different formats of ionizable LMPs. And the idea was here we're looking at how important is that composition uh, in terms of the immune responses? So we also track, so we fluorescently label the particles, see where they go in the mouse, and also see where they express. So these are mice that have been IM injected in both legs. So the fluorescence you're seeing here is your LMPs. Okay, so this isn't protein expression, this is where the LMPs are going. So you've got mRNA, self amplifying RNA. And what you can see here is your mRNA sits in site of injection, well, the lipids do, so does the self-amplifying. So the payload is not affecting the clearance from the injection site. Your choice of LMP, so it's just two different uh, ionizable lipids in here. MC3 is actually the Unpatra formulation, which is given IM. Genvoy is a proprietary from PNI. Again, the biodistribution is not affected by the choice of these particles. So they're sitting at the injection site. So one can assume when we got our Pfizer or our Moderna, it sat in our arm and then very slowly moved away. In terms of expression or how well they work, if you look at that now, this is the same five mice over time. It's not different mice. People get freaked out when they see this many mice, but it's the same five mice. So at six hours with mRNA, lots of protein expression, fades away quickly, and as shown here. And it doesn't matter which LMP format we use, same profile. But if you look at our self-amplifying RNA, lower dose, remember, five times lower, it does take longer to kick in because it's got to amplify, but then it gives us a stronger response. And you can see it's not until about day three and day six that the mice are starting to fluoresce in terms of luminescence of protein expression, and it does last much longer. So they both sit there, irrespective of the payload, they're sitting at the injection site, but one is having a slower expression than the other. But in terms of vaccine efficacy, so we did use for this uh, mRNA encoding for SARS-CoV-2. So again, you've got two different LMP formats, first injection, second injection in mice, antibody responses, you can see very similar profiles. So we get the self-amplifying RNA is giving us a good vaccine study eh, response, and that bias between IgG1 and 2A if you're into vaccines is very similar across them. So from that, we know self-amplifying RNA gives us a good response at low dose, and it, we can use different LMP formats to get the response we want. Okay, so that's about that. But what about the other aspects? So we've heard about PEG, and I'll, I'll not talk about that, but eh, what about the choice of the ionizable lipid? So nicely heard earlier, the summary that we've got our Pfizer with 30 micrograms and the ionizable lipid switches out between ALC0315 and SM102, so Pfizer and Moderna. And they both have those different pegs that we've been hearing about. Roughly the same dose, but slightly different constructs. And we know that. The other one we've got that's an LMP that was actually approved much earlier is Umpatra that's given IM, eh, sorry, IV injection. And it's very similar to SM102, to be honest. It's very similar, except the ionizable lipid. So we took it through our screening protocols uh, in the lab. So they go through HEC-293s for expression, uh, and then they go through BOBC mice for vaccination efficacy. So we have five LMP formats here. So DOTA 
is your original cation like lipid that's been used for years in expression of DNA. DOTAT is an ionizable, DLN is in Patra. Here we have Moderna, and this one over here is Pfizer. So what do I need to show you here? They're all roughly the same size using our manufacturing process. They've all got a nice low PDI, they all got a near neutral C potential, and they all load the mRNA. So physical chemically, we couldn't differentiate between them. We then take them in vitro. So this is expression with DOTAP. So this is in our cell culture. Our DODAP doesn't work. Now, I've had to rescale this because SM102, but you can see this one's very low. Moderna works very well. Pfizer, no response. Very low, well, very low. So Pfizer does not work in the HEC293 cells and we've repeated it many times and it's other people have published this. So the in vitro, the Pfizer formulation doesn't work. And if we didn't know it worked in vivo in humans, we wouldn't have been allowed to take this into mice because we had no data to support it. But we did take it in mice because obviously we've all had it. And here's your response. So now, again, the mice have been injecting both legs. And you're basically looking for that level of color. So you can see the DOTA and no doubt. They're the old ones, yeah, they're okay. And Patra is beginning to look good. SM102, the Moderna one. The key thing, and I think that was uh, your question about doses, these are given at the exact same dose. So this is uh, the Moderna at five micrograms per leg. And this is the Pfizer. So very strong response moving to the liver as well. So we're getting expression everywhere. So like for like doses, the Pfizer is given a much stronger uh, output than the Moderna copies. So remember, these are mimics that we make in our lab. We can't say for sure. It's the exact same. So take home message from this is, if you look at the physical chem characteristics, we see no difference. If we look at the in vitro, we would only take an SM102 into the mice. If you look in vivo, the Pfizer lipid is given much stronger response. And what basically we have no in vitro to in vivo correlation at the moment. And it's something we need to work on if we're going to improve these formulations further, because we just can't take everything into mice. And we also know from Realm and Shattuck in the Imperial study that going from mice to non-human primates, you saw a different study. And then Moderna have shown that going from non-human primates to human, again, there was a difference with non-human primates differentiating with particle size and humans not. So all these things we need to look at. So we have good vaccines, but we could do much better. And a lot of this is thought to be related to that lipid structure. So these are the ionizable lipids. So these three are very cylinder shaped. These two are more cone shaped. And the proposal is that when they get into the cell, these cone shapes help the endosomal release to get better expression. And that actually harks back to the very early work of the cationic liposomes that Frank Zoka was working on and when they first introduced those fusogenic lipids. So it's interesting that the work in the 90s is still uh, informing the work today. So overall, what we can see is we do have flexible and accessible platforms, but we need to think about availability of consumables and what platform you choose to use for manufacture. This understanding of formulation and function is important and pulling in exactly what David said as well. How does the peg component? We'd love to get rid of the peg, but if you take the peg out, the LMPs fall apart. So we do need to fix that and maybe come up with something else. We lack in vitro and vivo correlation at the moment. So we can't explore better formulations until we understand that. And I put characterization at the moment. Particles all look the same when we standardize through the standard parameters. Is there any way we can get a better insight into what physical chemical characteristics would give us a good readout for a particle? And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. So any questions for Yvonne? Um, good question, very good question. Yeah, so thanks. Very nice talk. I just have one small question. Um, so you mentioned one slice you can loading protein into the lipsome. And I I remember you mentioned about like using uh, acinol to dissolve the lipid and then mix. Mm -hmm. Would that acinol like I'm wondering if you have data about the protein activity, whether acinol yeah. makes them they will cause them um, deactive or uh, I, I like through the structure change or something. Yeah, like that. no, that is a very good question. So we did do circular diprobism 
with the OVA that we used and it was matched. So we sent OVA just through without the lipids and we sent it, like exposed it to ethanol and didn't. And in terms of structure, it was okay. But equally, I know that OVA is more robust than maybe other proteins. So mm. that would be something definitely if we were going down that route, I think we would have to do circular dichromism to improve or even a yeah, other proteins here, actually. We have used uh, proteins and vaccine studies and they also work, but again, a protein and a vaccine doesn't matter if you lose your 3D stru construct. Yeah. So mm. it's definitely an important issue and definitely should check. With these, we checked, but every protein will be different. So. Thanks. A kind reminder that you can also write your questions on Zoom, and I believe we have one. Yeah, so we have three questions on Zoom. So the first is from Noelia, who um, is asking regarding the amount of mRNA that you're able to encapsulate. So you showed with the different types of mRNA that you basically have 100% mm. encapsulation. Um, was this, in the example you showed, was this in basically comparing between mass or moles? And um, if not, did you basically take into account the number of nucleotides? Oh, yeah. Now, that, that's a good question and a horrible calculation, but yes. So we, we normally, the max we can produce is about 0 0.2 uh, or 200 micrograms per ml, but we always work at an end P ratio of six. So that is how we back calculate it. And so we do take into account our nucleic acid, but we also tend to say our nucleic, uh, we also average at T40 as the molecular weight for those doing the calculations. So with poly, we take off 12 as well. So, but yes, we do take it into account. And I think the max we can produce is more dictated by our lipid solubility than our mRNA. But the other thing is to think about when you come to the TFF, produce at lower concentrations and just concentrate it right up. And then you can get to pretty much any concentration you want within reason. <laughs> Um, so we have another question, which is how does the solvent removal uh, affect the liposome characteristics? Yeah, so we have done a study where we hold them for 24 hours, still in that ethanol content, but that was with 25% ethanol. They are okay with that at holding for 24 hours, but uh, I think it goes back to David's question, how stable is what we're exposing? So the lipids are happy, the liposomes and the LMPs are happy, but the drug payload might not be happy. So that's something you have to do. So the way around it, and that's what they do, is they just dilute out the ethanol straight away. If you do a one in five dilution straight away, uh, you'll get rid of your ethanol, and then you can concentrate back up later if you get any concerns. And you can dilute it as you collect as well. And actually, some of the PNI kit has uh, inline dilution. We tend not to bother with it, but you can do that as well. And so we also have another question, which I think we were just discussing, which is your in vitro and in vivo mm. correlation at the end didn't correlate at all. So this question is asking more from the ethical point of view is how how can we move towards in vivo if we don't have a good uh, in vitro model? But I guess more the question is, um, do we know why there is a difference or how to maybe mm. overcome that in the future? Yeah, so that is uh, it's a big problem. How do, ethically do we progress anything forward? So. Our, uh, what we do is in our benchmark, so we can say, okay, we do get some fluorescence, it can progress. But also, we are using a HEC-293 cell that doesn't have any immune things, so probably HeLa, we have never looked at it, is better. We have looked at the BHKs, which are baby hamster kidney, I think, is the, but they gave the exact same as HEX. We use HEX because they're cheap, cheerful, and grow, and everybody uses them. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend them. They're a good screening tool of is it working, is it not, but it doesn't differentiate, is it working well or is it working weak? But it's something, and we've actually just started my PhD student, she started today, but I need a look at home because I'm here, uh, on looking at that, can we get better in vitro models? We have more soon. Um, can I ask a question? Um, first of all, thank you so much. It's so clear, um, fabulous liposome talk. I'm, I'm in love with your presentation. Um, I have a question which I always wanted to, uh, as you know, I'm always interested in this correlation with in vivo mm -hmm. um, throughout my career. And throughout my career, I always wondered, why don't we just utilize phase zero trials? I mean, it connects with a question that was asked online. Why do we bother with all of this? And we just go straight to a human at a small pilot scale and then upscale or take it back from there. Exactly, yeah. I, I think it's, I mean, this data kind of shows that, uh, that yeah, 
mice, everybody makes a joke, mice lie, this lie, everybody lies. But yeah, I think there is an element of that because now we know if they're, if they're all proven to be non-toxic, just take them straight in. I think we do still need a tox study, but apart from that efficacy- Yeah, you build it up from a phase zero, small yeah, exactly. scale, low dose, micro dosing, and then you build it up. Exactly. I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of merit in that because we are spending a lot of time. I mean, it's great for academics, we get publications, but the reality yeah. is, you know, that we, we can miss it out because it's not helping. We have more <laughs> questions online. How are we doing with time? Um, so there's two similar questions, so I'll try to combine. So one is asking what your thoughts on the effect of the production method using microfluidics versus conventional thin film mm -hmm. hydration. Um, and the other linked question is basically, um, do you have any idea how the different micro microfluidic mixes could affect the formation of the nanoparticles? Oh, yeah. So two, two good questions. The first thing, the lipid film hydration is great. Uh, downside is there's countries now we can't use chloroform and it's really difficult to scale up. But there is other ways uh, to get around that and the extrusion is a very nice way and that's how DOPS was made. So I don't think microfluidics is the only way for sure. And I think it, the fact it's using it, a lot of solvent, if we can get rid of that. And we've looked at non-solvent producing methods. So that's that. In terms of the different mixers, for sure, I think geometry will have to take into account. And what we try and do in our lab is we, we're trying to be so that we can be equipment agnostic. If you say you want a nanoparticle produced at less than 100 nanometers, we'll figure out how to do it with that cartridge, with that machine. And I think that's the way to be. I don't think anybody that says this manufacturing method is better than that manufacturing method, I think, is being a bit naive because I think with the process optimization within microfluidic space, I mean, there's obviously bigger parameters. I think we can achieve what we want to achieve with all the different technology, dolomite, PNI, a micropore. I think we can all do it. Um, so one person is asking, have you tried coating the LMPs with um, basically different Polymers, so polysacrosine there, suggesting instead of PEG, and does this have any effect? It's a good, it's a very good idea. We haven't looked at that yet, and I think that's a Gregory one, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking, it's Gregory online. <laughs> but you know, it is a very good idea to look at that, and really, if we, I mean, as David showed, we really need to get that PEG out, but at the moment, it was all that was, it's all that's been looked at, and it is approved for use. But longer term, if we can get it out without the, if you don't put it in at all, you get particle size creep. They increase in size over time quite quickly, and it's quite notable. So that's why it's there. And then we have a question that um, most of the formulations shown is a mixture between uh, one lipid, I guess, one type of lipid and cholesterol. Is there any room for improvement with, say, a larger amount of lipid mixtures? Um, mm -hmm. And could this be mixed using uh, microfluidics? So I guess including different types of lipids yeah. in the same system. I, I think that's a very good one. Uh, I think that's a space to look in uh, for many reasons. Could it include a break in that intellectual property space? Because at the moment, they're all based on a four component mixture. So the IP space is locked out. And I would say in the UK, we're locked out of it. We have no access to ionizable lipid compositions at all. So if, you know, if we weren't using pure vax lipids in the Pfizer formulation, we wouldn't have it. So anybody that can come up with better optimization of lipids, maybe ditch one of them, convert in and out, then there's space. And I think it's definitely an area. We haven't done it, but definitely I would encourage people to get into that space. Can I ask you a logistical question? How did you get access to these lipids since you mentioned them? Ah, we use Broad Farm. So they chemically synthesize that and they're for research purposes only. Uh, but the quality is variable. I'll say you can now buy the Pfizer lipids from Sigma Aldrich Merck, whatever you call it. There's a waiting list. I think we've been waiting since January and they're now saying March, I think. So, but it's Advanti that, you know, Advanti who are pro does it, bought Advanti. Yeah, so you can get it from them. Do you, do you need to report to Pfizer or Moderna what you do? Yeah, we're all right. We've got, but remember, we're in the research space. So any company, we do company work, we have to tell them, you know, we'll give you the data, but remember this is research and development. You would then have to get a, go into a license agreement with your VAC, which would be painful, but not my problem. <laughs> uh, I also have a question on your uh, last slide. So we obviously, whenever we prepare liposomes, we measure zeta, zeta potential polydispersity index size. We look at them at the TM. What else? How can we characterize them in a better way mm. so that is reflective of actually the in vitro and in vivo efficacy? 
Yeah, that is, it's a good question. I think that there's a gap in the knowledge there. So anybody's working more in characterization, I would definitely think about this. When we're doing it, everybody says, oh, can you get us a cryo? And I was like, well, we could, but it's a thousand pounds a day. And all I will do is look around for the best photo. I mean, that's what everybody does. Uh, in terms of particle size, I think up two octagonal methods is the way we're going. The regulator hasn't asked for it yet, but NTA versus uh, the, uh, the tracker versus the typical uh, Zeta sizer would be useful. But again, it's not a requirement by the regulator yet. But I think it's something we need to look at because it's not shown. We can't see any difference. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry, in terms of uh, the flow rate, uh, mm -hmm. when you mix the HQ space and the ethanol phase, and in terms of large scale production, because you mentioned different uh, ratios, I just want to know, does this have any effect on the structural properties of LMPs, for example? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do all of them remain the same in regarding distribution of lipids in mm -hmm. the periphery, in the central? Yeah. And have you done some like cryo TM or mm -hmm. SANS studies in this? Yeah, no, good question. We have not done it. And what we actually did at one point was we really scaled up the dilution to a 19 aqueous to one ethanol because I really wanted to see if I could get rid of TFF just because it was a backlog in the lab. <laughs> and they all look the same doing our characteristics and the release profile of the protein with the liposomes was the same way. LMPs, they don't release, so it's difficult to see that structural attribute. But I think that it would be a consideration. And also, we don't know if we're getting any what we call ghosts, particles, ones without mRNA in them. We assume not, because if there's no mRNA, if you try and make them empty, you get massive size creep as well. But it might be going under the radar, the zeta sizer, because the new zeta sizer settings, have you seen it? It's got dust... Uh, it filters out dust filled and you have to shut all them off and then you start to see a second peak but who wants to see a second peak in your data <laughs> but yeah have a look at your zeta sizer settings it's quite interesting the new yeah. ones thank you i think we should prioritize any questions on zoom because there will be coffee and tea at the michael smith uh, cafe in case you want to meet with Yvonne and ask um your Easy questions <laughs> Uh, we have three, but uh, Tom is prioritizing okay. one. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I was going to try and combine again. So one person has a question basically on, uh, have you tried using different types of solvents other than the ones you showed? So they mentioned chloroform, but maybe others. Um, and then the linked question um, is, is the remaining amount of solvent, methanol, ethanol, IPA uh, in the liposomes, uh, is this suitable for clinical use or is there, say, a limit? Okay, yeah, them? two good questions. So. With uh, polymers like PLGA, when we make nanoparticles, we are using acetonitrile. And that you really need to dilute out before it hits TFF because your column basically contracts. The, it really doesn't like that. So we've used DMSO and we've used acetonitrile and then the three, methanol, ethanol, IPA. That's all we've used. And th that's mainly driven by compatibility with our cartridges that we use because they do damage it. So that was that one. What was the other part? Question I forgot. Uh, the other part was: Is there when you do the solvent removal? Is this is, is this ah, suitable yeah. for clinical use? Is there say an amount that you need yeah. to get? Yes. So we need to get it down to 0.5 percent with ethanol, and we do GC chromatography on that. Actually, yeah, there you go. <laughs> As if if I knew this. So, uh, so this is solvent removal. So uh, with TFF, I'd kept that aside just in case. So if you have two ml. You have to wash it 12 times that. So that's 24 ml. So if you imagine you've got a litre, it's 12 litres and it gets very expensive in terms of aqueous. So you're talking scaling up, you're talking swimming pools. So this is another reason I want rid of TFF if I can. You will also, after 12 washes, get rid of any non entrapped drugs. So we, we put empty protein there. But our particle size stayed the same. They look the same. So these are liposome. And we did get all our. Uh, lipid back out. So it does is use it as very aqueous solve aqueous phase heavy the TFF production. So to get down to regulated process, we need to wash 12 diafiltrate volumes, it's called. And that but that's in circulation. There is a cool way where you can paralyze them. So you can put like three in a row TFF things and then you can do it in line. We don't have that facility but CPI do in Darlington and that cuts it down. So 
And then I think we have one good question to end, which is what is your general view of the future prospects or potential of liposomes in drug delivery? Well, I think uh, the one good thing of the pandemic, I think it's really opened up the space. People are not frightened of this technology anymore. The regulator has lots of experience with it now. Before it was all nanotechnology. It's all about, you know, gets you into JCR publications, but nobody else cares. But I think it's really broken that mold. So I think there's space for all that, anything below 100 nanometers, there's lots of space at the bottom to make that joke. But I think the society will accept much more. I mean, if you remember, I think it's like Prince Charles, when he said about grey goo and all this. So all that nonsense is gone. People are very happy with all types of nanoparticles. So I think we will see them well back in use now, including our liposomes. We love liposomes. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. We do love liposomes. So thank you very much, Yvonne. Amazing presentation.